Uh, good morning. Okay, so um, <clears throat> again, thank you for inviting me to present. My topic uh, is an extension of the uh, panel discussion uh, brilliantly chaired by Bronwyn and Graham. Thank you very much for those thoughts. Uh, extending the idea of the strategic role of a treasurer, uh, I'm going to take a particular uh, perspective on this, and that is within the context of a wealth creating organisation. Uh, very soon into uh, what I'm about to say, you'll understand the context of uh, that aspect of the title. Um, one other thing I should say is um, we've had a couple of goes at this presentation, first in Sydney, then in Brisbane. Uh, we ran a uh, empirical research study to underpin uh, some of the elements of what we're going to say. Uh, I've restructured the material for today to be more sort of FTA focused. Uh, the consequence of that means that I can't really deal with the, uh, the empirical research, but it is contained in our white paper. It does look like this. Uh, I do understand it's been uh, forwarded through. Okay, so um, without further ado, I guess the core proposition I'm going to be making today is that uh, Treasury professionals can, if they choose, uh, but certainly we'd encourage to play an important strategic role in the, in the uh, building of a wealth creating organisation. There's a couple of important words. That is, goes well uh, over and above, well in addition to the must-dos, the traditional aspects of Treasury, which I'm not going to cover. Bronwyn, Graham and all the other speakers spoke about the must-do elements, but uh, the one point that we'd make is that delivering uh, from an operational effectiveness point of view on the core treasury must do's and I won't list them I'm not an expert in these things in our view is an absolute requirement to preserve the value of the organization preserve the value of the organization it's absolute fundamental underpinning that underpins the value of the organization um, based on some of the uh, uh, presentations, I think um, the, uh, on some of the risk metrics and sort of uh, strategies, our view is that it is possible to create some value for your organization by performing these must-do uh, functions more effectively. Um, I use the word effectively quite deliberately. It doesn't necessarily mean efficiency, which is a cost per something metric. Effectiveness has a revenue aspect to it. Um, so, you know, it is possible, we think, to uh, create some value by doing these functions more effectively over the long term. But as we kind of heard uh, earlier, um, in the long term, some kind of hedging strategies, by and large, are sort of, you know, maybe a net cost in the long run, certainly very difficult to sort of pick the winning, um, you know, the ebbs and flows. There you go. Uh, however, and this is kind of getting to our core point, we'd argue that once these must-do aspects have been taken care of, uh, Treasury professionals do have an opportunity to play an important strategic role uh, in helping the C-suite, uh, you know who those are, build a wealth-creating organisation. Uh, and so I've underlined that because the things that I'm going to be talking about today in terms of the potential uh, role that a Treasury professional could play in a strategic capacity well beyond the must-dos, we're going to be talking about in the context of building a wealth-creating organisation. We're going to explain what that means. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, what that means for us, the touch points for Treasury professionals is in helping to contribute in building and helping to manage what we call the internal capital market. Um, as a sort of internal mirror of the external capital market. We're going to specifically uh, talk about what that means in the context of a wealth creating organisation. So those kind of terms are quite important to us. Me, I should say I'm not a treasurer. Um, I don't have experience in treasury, therefore I'm going to, not going to touch the must-do aspects. I'm going to skip right through the must-do aspects. I'm going to talk on, uh, on my familiar turf, and my familiar turf uh, being a partner at KBA, is uh, we basically help executives build wealth-creating organisations. That's what we do. Everything we do at KBA is about that. And so I guess it's not... And, and by the way, what we mean by a wealth-creating organisation is, is an organisation that has the ability, through capabilities, 
generated internally to create value for customers and wealth for shareholders on an ongoing basis. Now those words ongoing basis are quite uh, seminal. Uh, the emphasis is intended uh, and you'll understand the context of that uh, in just a few wee moments. So I guess not surprisingly, uh, we're going to be describing the role, the strategic role of a treasurer in the context of building such an organisation um, because uh, we believe as a consulting firm and we touch base with many corporates and the investment community that uh, amongst uh, a number of other mandates, we believe the mandate of leadership, professional leaders, is in fact to build wealth creating organisations. It's hard to do but it is doable. Um, let me give our book a quick plug. Uh, we've recently published the first in a series of three books around a suite of topics. The first one is called The Legacy of Good Leadership. This book, um, when, when we were speaking in the Sydney conference, uh, in the lunch break, one of the participants asked us, well, so, you know, what are the attributes of a good leader? And I said, well, that's an interesting question, but that's not what the book's about. Uh, the book is, in fact, the operative word in the title in the book is the legacy. Uh, everyone knows that uh, organisations have leaders. Um, the senior treasury people are leaders. So, you know, within the uh, corporate finance team and, and amongst the uh, C-suite. So organisations have leaders. What this book is about is the creation of the legacy, that, that legacy-seeking leaders want to create. Um, I commend the book to you. Um, uh, it is available for purchase on the website, uh, nominated. The other thing I'd quickly say about the book is that a lot of the context around the ideas that I'm going to be talking today are contained in the book. I've only got about 15 minutes to kind of quickly skate through it, so let's try. Um, <clears throat> thought it might be useful to provide a little bit of context to start with some, uh, an understanding of some of the important truths about, here we go, ongoing shareholder wealth creation. I'm going to read these because the words have been uh, written uh, quite deliberately and specifically. So um, I guess I'll kind of read it with you. So number one, true commercial success for every listed organization means succeeding in two markets. The first is the market for the company's products and services. And the second is the market for its shareholder capital. Success in the first leads to the su success in the second. Okay. so. Fairly obvious statement, agreed? Okay, but it, but it says something very important is that you need to focus on two things, um, primarily focusing on winning in the market for your products and services, and that is a, um, an act of strategy, development and execution. I'm going to talk a lot about that, um, and then the context where the, the um, treasurer might fit within that. But a lot of people for a long time have sort of thought about sort of shareholder value as being the end game. In other words, you know, let's measure the success in the capital markets and, um, you know, sometimes we'll perform well, sometimes we'll perform badly. Our point is that success in the first drives the success in the second, therefore, therefore focus on the first and make yourself successful in that because it will then translate into superior wealth creation for shareholders. The question is, whether you can do it on an ongoing basis. And so we're going to highlight the words ongoing quite a lot. Second point, this is quite important. I'm hoping that all of the Treasury and sort of corporate finance people in the room will, will kind of intuitively understand that this if they don't explicitly. Wealth is preserved over a measurement period if management delivers the economic profit stream, um, uh, expectations that the market had at the beginning of the period, and wealth is created if management exceeds those. So in other words, wealth creation, success in the capital markets is all about outperforming expectations embedded in your share price at a point in time. Um, we're going to introduce to you the concept of a pair of bow waves to demonstrate that idea. But the important point here is that in the capital markets, success in the capital markets is about outperforming against expectations embedded in the share price. Problem is, once you outperform those expectations, your share price rises, therefore you've got new expectations which you need to outperform again. And that sets up the treadmill effect and the challenge of um, creating wealth on an on ongoing basis. Make sense? So once you succeed, the bar goes higher, you need to beat the higher hurdle, and the cycle goes on. 
that's what creates the treadmill effect and the imperative around this ongoing nature. It's no good to do this once or twice, because once you've done it, share price rises, the incumbent shareholders are happy, the new shareholders are saying, hey, what about me? Help me, please. So you need to do this on an ongoing basis. It is hard, it's doable. In the long run, shareholder wealth can, creation can only be sustained on an ongoing basis by establishing a cycle of customer value and shareholder wealth creation at a segment level. The name of the game is not efficiency, it is not cost cutting, although both of those things are moderately important at various points in the cycle. In the long run, it is about creating value for customers that translates into wealth for shareholders at a segment level. And that's what we help organisations set up. Um, and then a wealth creating organisation is one that's focused on encouraging and awarding the development and implementation of higher value strategies on an ongoing basis. So it's about strategies and funding those strategies, developing them, executing them, um, funding them, running the internal capital market, and therein, I think, is the clue as to where we think the role of a strategic treasurer might be in participating in that internal capital market. I'll demonstrate one point by introducing to you the first manifestation of a pair of bow waves. So here's, um, we are here today, uh, T0 is 2013, so kind of, this is kind of back in December 2013. <clears throat> the measurement, five-year measurement period um, begins from 2008 up to 2013. That's the measurement period we're talking about. The amber line, and I'm going to go on this screen if that's okay for the people in that room. So the amber line represents the, um, the okay, here we go, the amber line represents the economic profit expectations, the present value of which is reflected in the share price at December 2008, the beginning of the measurement period. So the first five years of that EP economic profit stream um, represents or is derived from consensus analyst forecasts that were in existence at the beginning of 2008 the remainder of the forecast from 2013 down to infinity or perpetuity is derived by an understanding that the forces of competition act to erode returns and growth back down to their natural state. And that's what drives the slippery slope effect of the first bow wave. Okay, um, the fact is we're sitting in 2013, at least when this uh, diagram was developed. So over the period from 2008 to 2013, the, the blue line over the, those five years measures performance delivered. And clearly you can then compare delivered performance relative to expected performance over those five years. In this case, the, uh, it's shaded red because there's an under delivery. But most importantly, from, oops, sorry, sitting from 2013, this is today, so for the next five years, the EP forecasts embedded in consensus analyst forecasts, beyond which the returns and growth erode to zero, which drives the other element of the slippery deep uh, of the bow wave. The present value of that economic profit stream up to 2013 rep is represented by the share price as at 2013. So I've got two share prices, one in 2008, represented by the present value of the amber line, one in 2013, represented by the present value of the blue line. The only thing we've done is sort of extended back the historical uh, performance. So now we can measure things against expectations in two ways. One is the extent to which management has uh, exceeded or under-delivered against performance over the measurement period. In this case, that's the red area. The second is the extent to which management has put in place strategies, or at least the market has bought into the idea that there are strategies, whoops, uh, once again, that will exceed expectations. This is the green area. Exceed the expectations relative to those expectations that were in place at the beginning of the measurement period. Two parts of the pair of bow waves. Um, so success is about uh, the, the words that we use is about exceeding expectations over the measurement period and putting in place strategies and capabilities to, to increase expectations beyond the measurement period. Make sense? Two time horizons. 
I'll just quickly show you what that looks like for the Commonwealth Bank. Sorry to our colleagues over here at the Commonwealth Bank. Um, this may uh, provide your CEO with a little bit of a shock, but here we go. The amber line is represented by the expectations embedded in Commonwealth Bank's share price back in June 2008. Um, but basically what that says is that, you know, um, banks, and this is, by the way, no surprise, so this is no uh, commentary on the Commonwealth Bank whatsoever. Banks are economically profitable and highly economically profitable, uh, and they're expected to become increasingly economically profitable to the tune of about uh, sort of, you know, $8 billion odd dollars, uh, but, you know, over a very long time horizon before the forces of competition are expected to erode returns back down to zero, okay? So those are roughly um, the kind of expectations embedded in the Commonwealth Bank share price at the beginning of 2000, or in June 2008. Between 2008 and 2013, Commonwealth Bank basically delivered uh, against those expectations, although sort of slightly post-GFC exceeded those expectations, so it did well. So basically it has a slight sort of present value of a green area over the measurement period, but by the way, the present value of the outperformance is about $1.1 billion, but, oops, sorry, most importantly, the majority of the wealth created by Commonwealth Bank for its shareholders has been delivered through an increase in expectations yet to be delivered. Um, the challenge for Commonwealth Bank is, does it have a strategy in place to deliver these expectations? Because if it doesn't, uh, you can imagine what's gonna happen. So um, I guess, so if that kind of describes the nature of shareholder wealth creation, and let me quickly talk to you about the key of ongoing shareholder wealth creation. Actually, I just want to go back to, <clears throat> back to this chart. So um, oh, let's go back to the generic chart so we don't keep beating up CBA. Um, okay, so in the generic chart, the blue line here represents outperformance, at least in the future, in terms of you know, expectations relative to some baseline. If those blue line expectations were then delivered, what's going to happen to shareholder value? And the basic answer is you will simply justify the share price back in 2013, which means that you are going to preserve the value of shareholders' investment in 2013. In other words, you're not doing anything special for them. So while you might have done something incredibly special to get from the amber line up to the blue line, the incumbent shareholders have um, re, um, you know, applauded you well, but then what you need to do is firstly deliver the blue line expectations, but more importantly, if you want to create wealth, you need to exceed the blue line expectations, and that sets up the conundrum of the ongoing cycle. So uh, in our experience, the ongoing cycle is uh, best represented uh, through um, a focus on customer value, which if you deliver a value proposition to customers which is more valuable than the past, some of that will get translated into higher revenues. And that's the, this little kind of link here, customer value translating into incremental revenue. If that's del delivered moderately efficiently, those incremental revenues will get translated into incremental economic profits, the present value of which is incremental value which gets captured through these shifting bow waves. That's the name of the game. I'm gonna speed up a little because I'm, David, I think you're gonna run me out of time. Not necessarily, okay. so, um, so that's the nature of it. The nature of it is ongoing in nature by implication in order to sustain this ongoing ability you need to set up this cycle of customer, customer value creation, which translates into shareholder wealth creation at a segment level. So the name of the game is to set up this cycle of customer value and shareholder wealth creation in our view, in our experience. So um, there are three fundamental capabilities required to develop, required to be developed that underpins this capability and therefore a wealth creating organization. One is, one capability represented by the chevrons in green here is, represent, is the value measurement capability. You need to be able to measure, measure where you're creating value, where you're destroying it and why at a disaggregated level within your organization. And I don't mean by divisions, 
I don't mean by business units in divisions. Ideally, what I'm talking about is segments within business units. Because to succeed in the market for your products and services, you, you compete at a segment level. You don't, you don't compete at a divisional level. So you need a capability or an ability to measure value uh, at a segment level. It's not the easiest thing to do. We do it all the time. It's not terribly hard. It is doable. Uh, pity few organizations do it, though. OK, so that's kind of an important foundation. Uh, the second thing is that you actually want to create value. So these are represented by about the five chevrons in blue. It's about creativity, innovation, developing value propositions for customer segments, putting those, uh, uh, you know, developing a strategy around those and uh, committing to doing them. This is a people-led thing. So when a lot of companies in their pursuit for dividend yield, chasing behavior, efficiency, capital effectiveness, and so on, when they cut costs, what they're doing is they're treating people to be commodities to be traded rather than assets to be developed. Because at the end of the day, it is people that uh, makes the glue to the ongoing cycle of customer value and shareholder wealth creation real. So those organizations that get themselves into a cost reduction trap have a terrible time succeeding in this game. And we're going to demonstrate some of that if we have time, David. <laughs> OK, the third bit is uh, value management capability. This is all about uh, putting in place a set of core processes around strategic planning, resource allocation, budgeting, uh, reporting and monitoring, and executive reward. So, in the spirit of speeding up, um, those core processes are roughly represented here. They represent what we call the internal capital market. So business units, people at the um, customer face are responsible for developing strategies uh, and capturing those strategies in what we call a prospectus quality business plan or strategic plan. Right? It's the first element of the internal capital market. Right? So it mirrors like the external capital market when you want to raise capital in the market, what's the first thing you do? You put together a prospectus. That's what a strategic plan is. It's an internal prospectus for capital. The second element is the strategy-based resource allocation process. And basically, the corporate center runs that. So business units develop strategies. Corporate centers do a couple of things to those strategies. Clearly, the corporate center is running a portfolio of businesses. So, you know, imagine you've got 23 business units. Each business unit has, you know, a dozen segments. Uh, but let's just deal with the 23 business units. Corporate Santa needs to make a decision as to whether they're going to be able to fund all the strategies in all of the business units and therefore know how much value uplift is going to be delivered. And that's the role of uh, the Corporate Santa in our view. Now, Problem is, most organizations that I've ever worked with, at least in the beginning, have as a core part of their corporate process the budgeting process. And the budgeting process is a particularly turgent process. It is absent of any strategic context. And it, more often than not, uh, is the catalyst that kind of uh, leads you down the slippery slope. Uh, if I leave one message here, can I leave the one message to make the budgeting process subservient to the strategic planning and resource allocation process. First two important elements of the internal capital market. The next thing is uh, plan-based or strategy-based performance management. It's all about, you know, so basically the, the way the conversation goes is business units put up a strategy through a prospectus quality plan presented to the corporate center who reviews the plan, comments, critiques on them, um, at the end of the day, approves the strategic plan, provides the resources to implement the plan, and basically what you have is a contract now between the business unit who is putting up a plan, who is requesting resources um, in, you know, in return for promised set of performance. The corporate centre is funding that strategy by providing capital and other resources in return for promised performance. That promise can only ever be live if the forecasts contained within the promise are in any way real 
and that management is actually committed to delivering it. But, oops, nevertheless, um, there needs to be a performance management process which is all about measuring and monitoring the extent to which performance against the strategy which has been approved is on track. And then if all of that is going well, uh, executives will be the C-suite uh, and the treasurers will be paid very well. So, uh, in a nutshell, this is the way it works. Basically, this is just one business unit. It's got about uh, four segments in this case. The current strategy has been valued to be about $800 million, of which about, uh, let's call it $650 million, represents the current capital invested. All right? So the market value of the balance sheet says the value of the business is 800, but embedded within that, I've got invested capital of 650. Therefore, the value uplift or the value created in some people's language is about $150 million. Makes sense. By the way, that light blue area represents the present value of the economic profit stream that underpins the 800. Okay. What's going on now is that this business is putting together a strategic plan which in a number of segments is promising a bunch of value uplift. And so the value of the business goes from 800 to about 990 on this promise, but contained in any promise is a requirement for resources. And by the way, even the current strategy, right, if I do nothing different, requires capital resources to be invested in the future. So what's being represented here is the incremental capital required over and above the capital required to fund the current strategy. Right? This is the inc oops, incremental capital required uh, to fund all of this value uplift. And the question now is, Mr. Treasurer, Mr. CFO, Mr. CEO, can I have these resources with a promise that I'm going to create you another $190 million in exchange for those resources. And the corporate centre is going to review the plans, they're going to, the Treasurer is going to do a whole bunch of things as well, which we're going to have a conversation about. And at the end of the day, there is either a deal, in which case you're on, or you're back to the drawing board, in which case you haven't put up a plan that's uh, sufficient for the corporate centre. So that basically describes, in our view, the context of the internal capital market, how it runs within a wealth creating organization. Um, very quickly, three minutes. Uh, what I'd like to do is pose the question, so within this context, what role can, the can a strategic treasury professional play in helping the C-suite build and sustain a wealth creating organization? Um, and um, to Bronwyn's point earlier, I wrote a few notes. Um, uh, Bronwyn said that it's important for a strategic treasury professional to understand the business and to be, you know, participate in strategy. Uh, well, what better way to understand the business and participate uh, and, you know, to you know, be part of the strategy than by participating in the internal capital market along the way that I've just described. And by the way, when you do that, you will be lifted to a helicopter level. So perhaps in the interest of time, can I suggest a couple of things that I came up with? And by the way, there's no monopoly on wisdom on this. You guys are uh, finance, uh, treasury professionals. You know your business. But let me suggest a few um, touch points. The first is in, in, in establishing and maintaining the core elements of the value management capability, which was that green ribbon a couple of slides back. So, you know, about allocating the balance sheet to business units and segments, right? Who is in a better position to understand the consumption of the balance sheet, right, capital? Second is to define the business unit cost of capital or to define the group's cost of capital and to the extent that you find it appropriate, um, make a determination as to, you know, whether a particular business unit's cost of capital is higher or lower than the group's average, right? Because the cost of capital provides an important benchmark in the valuation of a business. Next thing is to establish uh, some forecast parameters for macroeconomic variables. Who better than the Treasury to have a view as to what's going on with FX, commodity prices, uh, interest rates, at least on the forward curve. You know, in other words, your risk neutral position. These are very important macro parameters that underpin any forecast and therefore any valuation. Because we're about value based strategy development. Um, applying your corporate finance skills to develop and maintain the, the valuation models. Why not? Who's better 
than Treasury professionals in their corporate finance understanding and to put together and maintain the valuation models that the business units use to value their strategies. Why not? So there's a couple of technical elements. The second is to assess, in, in our view, this is just what we came up in sort of five minutes thinking about this, right? I'm sure you can come up with better. So the second is to assess, advise on, and where necessary, mitigate risks associated with strategic plans. In other words, what that means is that you, you as corporate finance uh, and treasury professionals are at the table with the C-suite when they're reviewing the strategic plans and you are having a view on risk, the extent to which the plans uh, either alter the risk profile and therefore the cost of capital um, uh, and so on. Um, the next bit is uh, put in place the strategies to fund the strategic plans or uh, heaven help us where necessary to ration capital. Now, um, uh, I like to think, and we like to think as a consulting firm, that capital and other resources I, I would ideally be viewed as being plentiful but expensive. In which case, you're going to fund every strategy, right? Because you've already embedded the cost of that capital within the valuation of the business. But where there's a genuine feel that there are resource constraints, uh, who better than the treasury professional to, assist, to assist the CEO in making the awful trade-offs around capital rationing. Which business units and which strategies are you going to fund and which ones are you going to constrain? But can I just make this point, that every time you ration capital, there are obviously return capital risk and reward trade-offs, which pity few organisations understand. And so when we see um, uh, strategy guy, well, budgeting is guised up as strategy. Effectively, budgeting is all about rationing. Agreed? And so when you ration through the budgeting process, there are deleterious flow on consequences that pity few organisations understand. So in other words, do capital rationing vary with your eyes open? David, I think I may have run out of time. Uh, there are a number of other slides. We did want to give you some of our thoughts on some research around uh, the negative consequences of a cycle of disinvestment. Uh, if I just spend 30 seconds, basically the answer to the research is that there's about a third of the ASX 300 companies that over the last five years have engaged in a cycle of disinvestment with, uh, with a, an objective of uh, higher dividend yield chasing type outcomes possibly in the mistaken belief that they will be rewarded for that behaviour. The evidence uh, suggests that they are not. So here are the unsustainable yield chasers, those groups that are chasing yield by disinvesting. They've got the lowest shareholder returns, lowest TSR alpha, which is another metric of the economic metric of return. Uh, and so basically the conclusion from our research is that even within low bond yield in environments, the safest and most reliable path to ongoing shareholder wealth creation is through sustainable growth. In other words, this is another, um, we've, we, we do research all the time. Uh, another aspect of the research that confirms uh, beware of engaging in um, the cost reduction trap. Uh, it's, it's not a good place to be for a corporate. Thank you very much. <laughs>